So let's consider things that give rise to decreases in virulence, that is, select for decreases in virulence within parasite populations. So let's consider that regardless of whether reproductive restraint and economy may be selected for on a population level, and, and this would be population level within a host or population level between hosts, on an individual level, there is an expectation that selection will favor faster reproduction. So regardless of what the broader ecology tells us, when we have an individual, and particularly if there are no trade-offs associated with it, if it can replicate faster than its competitors, then it should be more successful. So selection, you have an expectation, at least at sim in simplistic or short-term senses, uh, you have an expectation that selection will be for a reduction in restraint, uh, which would be a uh, increase in uh, re rates of reproduction, uh, an increase in expedience, which is pretty much saying the same thing, and also a resulting increase in virulence. If faster reproduction results in greater virulence, you have an expectation that selection acting on individuals within populations will be for those individuals that in fact display a greater level of virulence. However, there are constraints on this evolution of ever greater virulence. So there are constraints on the ascension of cheater individuals within populations. So this would be selection for greater restraint, selection for greater economy, and selection for decreases in the virulence associated with individuals. Uh, this is again making the assumption that uh, virulence here is a function uh, entirely of uh, the rate of replication of individuals with higher rates of replication resulting in greater virulence and lower rates uh, resulting in less virulence. And this is rates of replication as they occur within individual host organisms. So what are these three constraints on this ascension of cheater individuals? So the first we've talked about, it's a genetic bottlenecking. If you start infections with just a single individual and thus achieve clonality, uh, then at the start of infections, there will be zero genetic variation within the population. If there's no genetic variation, then there is no variation in virulence between individuals within the population, and therefore you cannot have selection uh, for increased levels of virulence. Uh, finite durations of infections can be important as well because a way in which virulence can enter populations is through mutations and the greater the number of individuals making up a population, the longer that the population uh, persists over time, uh, then the more mutations that have the potential to enter that population. If you don't have those mutations entering the population, you maintain, maintain uh, this lack of genetic variation uh, which can can result in a lack of evolution of reduced restraint among individuals. Uh, but if you allow the population to last for long periods of times and consist of very large numbers of individuals, then you start exploring sequence space uh, fairly effectively and therefore genetic variation in terms of differences in virulence can enter into the population, resulting in selection on virulence within populations infecting individual hosts. Another issue we've talked about already, which is basically antagonistic pleiotropy. So it is not always the case that individuals that display reduced reproductive restraint also uh, will display an enhanced or even hold on to their level of uh, ability to transmit that you're seeing, that you can see with the individuals that display more restraint. Uh, we saw this already, we discussed it already in terms of sporulation. If you you have individuals that uh, sporulate when, when the spore formation occurs, uh, a cell that otherwise could be replicating is lost. If spore formation is required for transmission, uh, then you could have selection for increased growth rates within populations uh, by the within host populations, within populations infecting a single host. Uh, if you have selection for individuals that uh, display faster growth by displaying sporulation at a lower rate, 
This reduced level of sporulation, though it can result in faster reproduction within a host, it can also result in lower potential for transmission. And that's an antagonistic pleiotropy. It's a trade-off between two different life stages. Uh, one of the life stages is the transmission. The other life stage is replication within a host. And when you have greater replication in a host, that comes at the expense of greater transmission ability. That's an antagonistic pleiotropy. And it's also an antagonistic pleiotropy that should select for reduced levels of virulence. In this case, it's not necessarily selecting for reduced levels of virulence within the individual host that is harboring a parasite population, uh, but between hosts, uh, the individuals that uh, are displaying this reduced level of transmission associated with their higher level of virulence. Uh, in fact, will be less represented over time and that will be selected against. So you have selection within a, a host for a lower level of virulence that comes about not so much due to natural selection acting within the host, uh, but instead by making it so natural selection can't occur within the host by substantially reducing genetic variation at, at both at the start and uh, over the course of the infection. And then you have the potential for uh, uh, evolution of greater levels of virulence uh, within the host to be counterproductive with regard to transmission and therefore you have a expectation that natural selection as it occurs between hosts at the transmission step uh, will tend to select for individuals that display lower virulence.